Hello YouTube, welcome back to the Blaze to Be Shop and another project video. What should be the last part in our Triple BS Knife Lock Build Series. So we left off last time is we've got our knife together, we've got it test fit, and we just don't have a lock mechanism on there yet, so there's nothing keeping it open. So today's video, we've got a couple things we need to accomplish. We need to finish these little cover plates that are going to go on there to hold our lock mechanism in place. So that's what's going to bolt on the side. We're going to engrave a patent number in there, so we're going to try engraving for the first time. And we're going to go through and we're going to use a etching machine and we're going to etch the Blades to Be logo on the blade in there. So those are the, uh, the main pieces that we're going to focus on today. So to start with, to be able to hold those cover plates, need to make a little jig to be able to put in the, the Tormach here. So we're going to make a jig and we're going to set up the drilling and counterboring of those holes. So we're going to head up to the computer to do that and then we'll come back down here and we'll start cutting the plates. So for those of you subscribed to the channel, I sure appreciate you watching all these videos. If you're new to the channel, want to see more videos on machining, welding, knife making, everything else we have going on here in the Blades to Be shop, then a uh, good time to go ahead and hit that subscribe button. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump on the computer and let's do a little bit of design in Fusion 360, and then we'll be back down here in the shop. Let's go. All right, so it took me right at one and a half hours to CAD, computer-aided design and CAM, computer-aided manufacture these parts on here to make the cover plates and the jig to hold them. Not gonna make you watch an hour and a half of me playing in Fusion. So I speeded this up to eight times speed. It's gonna take about 10 minutes to go through here. Not gonna teach you how to be a master in Fusion 360, but it will give you a good overview of the process, that 100,000 foot view, and you'll know what to Google uh, if you wanna look something up. So first step here is we've created our drawing. I'm going to go in here and save this and give it a name. That way I can create individual components for the parts that we want to make. So I want to go in here and create my first component, which I'm going to create the cover plate. And then we'll create our second component, which will be the cover plate jig that we're going to make next. So let's get that second component created here. And that way it keeps my sketches and everything lined up with those components. So first I'm gonna go in here to component one, that cover plate, and I'm just gonna quickly create this cover plate. So it is just this oval plate, got the dimensions on here, and I'm gonna put on a couple of the holes just because that's where I know things line up to. I still like to drop points on here and dimension my points in place. Again, that's just how my mind works. That's what makes sense to me. I know that you can definitely do lines and constraints, and uh, there are different ways to do this. Once I have the sketch done, then I'm going to go ahead and extrude that out to get the thickness of my part, which is the 16th of an inch thick. So now that I've got it extruded out, we're going to go ahead and put our holes on here. Nice thing about that hole feature is once I create that first hole, I mark it for the size. I'm actually gonna go ahead and put the counter bore directly on these as well. And then once I have that done, I can go up and I can select other points and I can just duplicate those holes across the other points. So it makes it really easy to make all three holes the same. So now those holes are drilled through, counter bored, and now we're gonna mirror our part. So I'm gonna go up, I'm gonna select the mirror. You select which plane you wanna mirror it across. And I now have a right-hand cover plate to go with that left-hand cover plate that I just created. And it's actually the right-hand cover plate that we're gonna do the engraving on. So I'm gonna make the left-hand one disappear, flip this around and put some text on here. So that's just another part of a sketch. And I found out you can't actually extrude the text, uh, but once you sort of try to extrude it, then it does create all those individual bodies. I went ahead and moved those to line them up with the, uh, the right-hand plate that they're on. But now I have both my plates, I've got the engraving on there, and now it's time to go and make the actual jig that we're gonna use to hold these. So the jig is just a two inch by five inch piece of quarter inch aluminum that I'm gonna use down in the shop. So I created that, and now I want to mock up the holes that I need to put on here to be able to put cover plates in there. So kind of back to the same process. I'm drawing that same sketch again, that same uh, oval, 3 eighths wide, 700 thou center to center. I uh, put them both on there, decided I wanted to center them up on the plate a little bit better. So I'm gonna drag those down and position them a little bit better on the plate. And then I really, I don't need to actually screw the left-hand side one down but I do need to screw the right-hand side one down. 
So, but I'm going to go ahead and, and set it up so that I put all the holes on there. Uh, maybe I'll have to hold one down at some point in the future. So same thing. I'm just going to lay out my same points and get all these in place so that I'm going to be able to go through and, and put the tapped and counterboard holes on here. So knock out all those holes, get those all dimensioned and lined up. And in addition to the holes for the plate, I'm going to put an additional 4x40 hole through my piece of aluminum. And that is what I'm going to use to hold the plates into the jig to drill and counterbore the first time. And then on that right hand plate to engrave it, then I will drill and tap the, the holes in my piece of aluminum. And I'll be able to actually screw that in place when I do the engraving. So couple steps we're doing on the, the right-hand side plate, one step on the left. So I extrude those grooves in there. So now I've got a slot that my plates are going to sit into. Made it about 3 thou oversized. So make sure my plates will fit. Now I'm going to, again, tap, counterbore those 256 holes in there so that I'll be able to screw that right-hand plate down for the engraving. And I'm going to go through and knock out those two 440 holes. And that's what I'm going to use just a screw with a washer to hold my plates in that recess while I drill and counterbore them. So that's what the jig is going to look like. And now it's time to uh, lock them in place. So now I've got the jig and by doing separate components, I can now set up joints and I'm now locking my cover plates into position. So I needed to flip this left hand one over to get it to line up. And again, I just set them up as rigid joints, locked those into place. And now my plates are locked into my jig so that I can do all my manufacturing and everything from the same point. So we're switch over to the manufacturing side and I'm actually just going to hide those two bodies. I'm going to hide those two plates, get my first setup going, and I don't want any extra material. I'm not actually going to machine my jig uh, at all to size. So I'm getting rid of all those extra dimensions. So now I've got a two inch by five inch piece of aluminum held in the vise. I'm going to set up my XYZ off of that top left corner there. And I'm going to go through and start to manufacture this. So I actually drilled the holes first, but you'll notice after I machine the two slots in there, I will change the order so that I'm going to machine out the slots first. So machine out those two pockets. Get that done with a uh, just using a 5 16 end mill to make those 3-8 slots. So it's going to have a little bit of room to go around. And now that that's done, again, you'll see that I'm going to move the order. So I'm going to set it so that I'm actually going to machine those 2D pockets first, and then I will go through and drill the holes after that. So now that we've got that done, check out a little simulation on machining those pockets in there. Make sure that that's what we're looking for. And then I'll change the order, put that 2D pocket first. Now it's time to drill and tap those 440 holes in there. And that's what's actually going to secure our plates onto the jig. And then we should be just about finished with this jig after we get these uh, two 440 holes drilled and tapped on there. So now that we have that done, uh, last step, tap those holes. And then I'm going to go ahead and just copy this entire first setup and use a copy of this first setup. And that's what I'm going to start from to create my next setup. So I go ahead and copy, paste that, delete all the machining operations that I had in that setup from the first go around and start over again. You see now I turned on those other two bodies. Now I can see my other two models in there. So I'm gonna edit the setup and I'm gonna select those other two bodies to make sure that I can select the parts on those for machining. And I'm gonna go through and just do pretty much just drilling counter boring operations here. So go through and drill those first six holes on there. Get through those. And then we'll set that up for a, uh, the counter bore size and go through and drill the counter bore on those six holes in there. All right, quick simulation. Make sure that I got the depth right because I didn't want to go all the way through and mess up where I'm tapping the holes on the jig. So I made it go through about 10 thou through the plate just to make sure it's good. And now we're going to select those counter bores. Go through and make sure that we're counter boring those six holes. So ran the simulation a couple times. Everything is looking good. And now it's time to work on this engraving. So for the engraving, just 
selected engrave feature selected all my pieces there for chaining together 22 chains and let's take a look at the simulation on this engraving so it does go around it does just do one pass on those letters the only times it's doubling up is on like the little period and some of the other parts so haven't done engraving on this machine before but it looks like that is doing what i want it to do so now I'll set up my post process on these Oh, no, I know what I'm doing here. No, I went through and I had, this is where I made my mess up on my titanium versus aluminum tooling. So I had set up those drill and counterbore speeds and feeds for aluminum, needed to go back and update those for titanium. So now for the post process, they changed this a little bit on Fusion. So every time you go in there, you need to select the library you want to go to. And then also it doesn't default to uh, which tool offset you're going to use. It took me a minute to remember where to go set that. You actually set that in your setup. So I gave it a name and that's where I'm going to select G54 offset. And then I won't get that exclamation error when I post process them. So now I've got both of these post processed and we're ready to go down to the mill and start machining them. Let's go. Well, I was about to head downstairs to the mill and I remembered that I need to take just a little corner out of these cover plates to make sure that they don't cover up the counter bore and interfere with the pivot screw that goes in there. So I went ahead, came back and added that counter bore. So we're going to go ahead and on the jig, we will punch that in there. And then we added that same thing so that on the cover plates, it's just going to go and just tick that little corner off and just make that so that that screw will go in there and not interfere. So added those two steps and and now we're ready to head down to the mill and start knocking these things out. All right, so we've got our design done. So I've printed off the setup sheet for this part. First, we're gonna go in there and make the jig. And actually on the computer, I set it up to be a two by five inch piece of aluminum for the jig. I actually had a handy scrap piece of aluminum that is three by four and a half. So we're still gonna set up on the same corner over here. We're just gonna have an extra inch of material and device down here that won't matter. And our parts are gonna be a little closer to the edge since I'm only four and a half inches wide instead of five. So we'll just lose a quarter of an inch. Actually, we'll just lose it all off of this one. So we'll be a half an inch closer to the edge over here on this end. I think based on the width of our part and everything, it should still fit. So we'll find out quick enough. So I've got that bolted in there. I took that piece and I did machine the top and the bottom and I machined a little spot over here so that I'll be able to probe it and get my X, Y, and Z set up and be able to get good repeatability to use this jig in the future. And we need tools number 22, 51, 55, and 62. You can see that I've got those loaded in here. So we've got tools number 22, 51, 55, and 62 loaded in here. So let's get our part probed. And I am going to hand tap those uh, two by 56 holes. I'm still just not comfortable rigid tapping those. And I don't want to have to pull my plate out of here to use the tapmatic. So we're going to go ahead and, and just hand tap those. And even this number 62, the 440 tap, didn't go very deep with that. So we'll be finishing that up hand tapping as well. And then we'll be ready to set these little cover plates in there and machine them. So let's get this probe and let's run this cycle for the jig. All right, so I just put in my probe, make sure I have told it that I've got the probe in there, tool number 99, and let's set up our XYZ. And there we go, X, Y, and Z are set. Probe out of there, set it back to tool zero.
And there we go, about four and a half minutes and we have a jig. So we're just gonna go in there and you can see we've got thread just a little ways in those 440 holes. Need to go in there and tap those 256 holes. And let's see how we're doing on size. I tried to make those just a little over. Yes, good. They're just a hair over, but still a little tough. Let me get a little something to get those out of there. Went in there nice and easy. So we'll find something to pull those out. And they are just five thou up over top. So when I bolt that down with a washer, it's gonna be just enough to hold that in while we drill and counter bore and knock out this little lip over here. But we'll knock those out and then we will screw this one down so that we can try out this engraving on there. All right, let's go ahead and get some hand tap going. All right, so our jig plate is done. Now it's time to actually make these cover plates. Again, we've got our setup sheet printed out. We need four different tools, 13, 22, 24, and 27. And this time we're gonna make sure we interrupt our cycle. We're gonna use a MO1 break between tools number three and four because it's gonna go through and it's gonna drill the six holes in the plate and then it's gonna counter bore them and then it's gonna go back and do that 5 sixteenths, just knock a little bit off of that corner of the plate, the piece we almost forgot on the drawing. And I wanna interrupt it after that to make sure that I can take out the 440 screw and put in the three 256 screws to hold it down before we go in there and engrave on the plate. So I'm gonna make sure I set that up to interrupt between those tools. And you can see that that's what we've got for a cycle. It should put our patent number on there. And we've got our correct four tools loaded in there. Let's get these uh, bolted in there. And we should, within about a minute and a half, have a couple of plates done and be ready to try engraving. There we go. We got a couple of them bolted in there and ready to go. Let's execute. So that was interesting. In this new post-processing that we went through up there on Fusion 360, it actually posted this one with a G56 starting point. So I don't know if you noticed, but it was trying to drill holes out there way in the wrong place, thankfully out in space, not out in some crazy place that it didn't crash. Uh, but I hadn't noticed that. So when I looked, it was actually on G56 there and line 18 said G56. So I just went in here to the file editor I just went over here and I edited that file. I changed it to G54, so it should be the same as the last file that we ran. And we should already be set up on G54. So hopefully this works. Uh, definitely gonna have to figure out this new post-processing up there in, uh, in Fusion 360. You know, we, I noticed I had that new screen. I thought I had it figured out, but uh, obviously got something a little bit wrong. So something new to pay attention to up there. Let's give this a try again. Before we run those parts again, let me show you what I figured out here in Fusion 360 and where I made that error. If we go in here to the setup, and when I was saving these files, the first one, it showed that it was going to default to a G54 uh, work offset. And what was happening was by default now, this is zero, this work offset. So it starts out, it was at zero. And if you post a file that way, it, it tries to figure out what it's going to do. One is what translates to my G54 offset. I was trying to go in here and type my offset. I was trying to type in G54 and I would hit OK. But when I would go back in there to edit, it wouldn't hold that. It would Sometimes it was mostly going to one, which was working. So that was good. But I came down here to our second setup. And somehow in my trying to type in and change it, that one got changed to three and work offset three. It goes G54, G55, G56. So number three is what translates to that G56. So I need to put that back to one. And if I hit OK, then when you go back in there, it's going to hold that and it will stay at one. And that's what you want. One is what it, uh, what it understands. You can't put in your G54 offset number. You have to pick which numbered offset it is for the machine. I guess before all the other programming I was doing, it was always defaulting to one, didn't have any issues. Now it's defaulting to zero 
and you need to make sure you're going in there and putting in the correct work offset. Glad I got that figured out. Shouldn't have that happen again. I'll make sure that I'm on top of that for future post-processing. Good learning. Just very happy that it wasn't a crash. Didn't have to pay a stupid tax on that one. Learning all the same. Let's get back down to the machine and let's run these parts. That seems to have put them in the right place. So we got our G54 back in the right spot. Counter bore, clean out the corner, stop it, get ready to engrave. turned on that M01 brake. Give me a chance to put these screws in here. I think I may be a little deep on those. I'm trying to trick my jig. That was sticking up an extra five thou. Maybe I did my five thou the wrong direction because I think I'm a little deep on those counter bores. So we may have to go tweak our code and, and try this again. Um, I may have been off 10 thou. I may have done something backwards there because I went the depth of the plate. I was trying to go 25 thou from the top of the plate which should have added five for this so anyway we'll have to go back and check the depth we'll, we'll pull one out of there in a minute but yeah i'm just looking at how those screws went in there and i think i'm a little too deep on those counter bores but let's get that screw out and try our engraving and we may have to uh, i may have just wrecked these two plates here we'll see what we got Pretty short work of that. We definitely got a patent number engraved in there. I'm kind of thinking the same thing. Maybe I went a little too deep on that. That may be deeper than I need to go. So let's pull these plates out of there. Let's see how deep we actually counterboard. And I may need to go tweak the code. I think maybe I went somehow backwards on my pluses and minuses there. Maybe went a little too deep. Definitely got a patent number in there. So hey, and that made short work of that. All right, let's get these out. All right, let's try this again. So it did a couple of different things. I noticed as I was clamping these down, it's moving my plate a little bit. So I went ahead and added an extra hole over here on my jig plate. So now I'm making sure that I'm holding those down nice and square. Also, instead of trying to outsmart Fusion 360, uh, you know, I had my model height set off of X, Y, and Z back here for the jig. So I just went ahead and I'm still going to use that for X and Y. I'm just going to use the top of this as my Z height. And that way I don't have to try to figure out if I'm doing my plus or minus is the right way for this sticking up 5,000. So I've got this as my Z, that is my X and Y back in the corner. And we're going to go ahead and run this again. And now all of my heights should be off the top. So I should only be going down, you know, five or six thou deep for my engraving and 30 thou from the top of this for those counter bores because they were definitely too deep on that other one. So let's go ahead and try this out and we'll see if we get it a little bit better.
Well, that turned out a little better that time. I think you can see that engraving on there. I'll do a zoom in magnifying and I'll drop in a picture of that as well. But there we go, we got those counterboard drilled to the right depth. Interesting, I'm sure you probably will see that from the other video, but uh, since I'm drilling through those with an end mill, it pops the little disc out the bottom and it's dropping it in the hole underneath. So before I can actually screw this down, I had to pop that little disc out from underneath. Anyway, a little time consuming, but now that I've got this jig set up in here, I think I'm gonna go through and knock out uh, several more cover plates while I've got it set up. We'll jump ahead and let's move on to etching our logo onto this blade and then we're gonna be ready for assembly. So let's head over to the etching table and take a look at that process. All right, so here's gonna be our etching process. I have this Personalizer Plus electrochemical etching tool. There's a little better shot of it right there. Comes with the power supply, and then it comes with the little two electrodes. You ground it, and you've got your electrode. Put a pad on it, dip that in the chemical, and then we'll use that with our stencil. And we're gonna go ahead and knock this out. Get a little better shot of the stencil there. So the stencils are reusable, so that's got my logo in it. So that stencil is what I will tape in place onto the blade, and we'll make sure that we get that lined up where we want it. So that's why, to start with, first we need to figure out exactly where on the blade we want to do that. So I'm just going to mark that with a Sharpie before I take the blade apart, make sure we know where we want that lined up. And the whole process, once I get it taped in place, we just run that etcher for one minute, and that's going to put the mark on there. So pretty quick process once we get it all put together. All right, so let's mark that blade, get it taken apart, and let's get this etched. Pretty much want it centered between those two marks right there. All right, so we want to center that up between those two marks. Up there is our center point. Okay, got that ready to go. My pad on here. Get my pad in the chemical. Get that grounded, we'll get this turned on. So I'm gonna etch it on three, and I'm gonna etch it for one minute. Get my timer going. And let's get our etch. Can sort of feel it while it's making contact. Sometimes you can hear it a little bit, and I guess I better start my timer if I want to keep track of a minute. All right, starting to be able to hear that a little bit more now. I just move it and rock it around a little bit, make sure it's making good contact. Again, you can feel it while it's working. You can sort of just feel the current vibrating in there and you make sure you've got good contact. All right, but the extra time from where we started, we'll call that good. So you can see that you get some color transfer over here where that metal is just being cut out of there essentially. And there is our mark. We'll get some neutralizer on here. Make sure we clean all that solution off so it doesn't keep eating away at our blade a little bit. And there it is. I'm gonna go hit that on the buffer just to clean up a little bit where it kind of blurs around the edge. So we're gonna hit that on the buffer and then I will get a nice picture of that close up so you can see what that looks like. But that's it, that's an electrochemical etch. The stencils, again, you can use those a lot of different times. You can buy stencils with just about anything on it that you want. So pretty versatile marking system and definitely a lot easier than having to take all your things to an engraver uh, and it makes a pretty nice mark. And just barely hit that on the buffer, just took the little bit of the blurred edges off of that and we're left us with a nice mark. So like I say, I'll drop in a nice close-up picture of that, and you can see what that looks like. Well, here we are after six videos of making parts. Here is everything laid out. So we'll kind of walk through all the pieces and parts here, and then we're going to assemble this and 
make sure we have a good functioning knife. So obviously we've got our pocket clip. I just actually purchased these from MXG Gear, just a company that you can find online. I like their pocket clips. So right now I'm just buying those instead of making the pocket clip. I may make some at some point in the future. Three screws that hold that on. We've got our threaded pins that are gonna hold the two halves together. One screw on each end of those. And then we have our cover plates that we just finished up today with our patent number on the backside of one of those. The three screws that hold those cover plates on. Underneath the cover plate, you've got a ball bearing, the spring, and the pin and the thumb stud. So these springs, I actually had to work with a company here in Dallas, Texas called Newcomb Spring and they were able to make these, they call them a magazine style spring since they're kind of a rectangle instead of round. So they were able to make those miniature magazine style springs for me. So thanks to Newcomb Spring for that. And this pin and the thumb stud, I made the first couple for my prototype, but a uh, little bit cumbersome to make this little pin right here. So right now I'm actually getting these from a company called Carbide Pros. So Carbide Pros is who's making that pin and they also make the thumb stud. So they're made out of 416 stainless steel and hardened. So a nice hardened pin to match up with that ball bearing. So we've got the same pieces going in on the other side. We've got our titanium spacers that we made that are gonna go on top of those threaded shafts. And then on the blade side, we've got our pivot pin with the screws on each end of that. We've got our pivot bushing. We've got our thrust washers there. We've got our stop pin and then obviously we have our blade to hold all of it. By my count I've got 42 pieces total to assemble here to make this knife. So a total of 42 pieces. So let's go ahead and put all 42 of these pieces together and let's check the action on this knife and make sure it is working. Let's go! All right, make sure everything's working there. Let's go ahead and we'll get our pocket clip on here. Basically set that up so it lines up in about the middle of the knife there. Drop our bearing in there. Drop our spring in there. And we actually want to assemble that with the blade open. A couple drops of oil down in there. And we'll go do the same thing on the other side. Uh, just a little snug on that cover plate. All right, let me go clean just a little bit off of that. There we go. Most of the parts we've got enough clearance for, but just a couple of rubs of some emery, and that's good. So those cover plates, those are actually water jet cut. Got another place that cuts those for me. Tolerance on them is pretty good, but, you know, it's plus or minus a little bit. So that one just had to give it a quick rub and drops in there. There we are with our cover plates on. Yeah, patent number's pretty subtle there on the back side, so that looks good. Our logo there on the front. And now for these little thumb studs, I actually had to make a little tool to hold on to these. Just got some little rubber gaskets in there. And if you take the first one out, it lets you hold on to that to get it started. There we go. Get those started in the hole. Once it's started, drop the other gasket on. You can push a little harder and turn it the rest of the way in. And then we can give them just a little bit, make sure that they are tight. I ran into a problem here. So we got this all together and the lock mechanism on the front side working great. Lock mechanism on the back side was binding up, was really tight. Took me a little while to figure out what was going on there, but let's jump ahead and we'll talk through that piece of it. All right, so we got that back side together. And then that pin was so stiff it wouldn't even move for me. So it took me a minute to figure out what was going on. And it's just that one slot, maybe not quite as deep on this side, so the pin was binding. It actually, if you pulled it straight back, it would move. But trying to pull it on the angle, trying to slide that pin, it just wanted to bind in there a little bit. So now we got both of them done. And there is our folder complete. Action's maybe a little bit tighter than it is on that cleaver on my other one although it's pretty nice and everything is good. We've got good play this way, but here is where I've got a little bit of play. It's a little loose. 
And that is because if you remember back in, I don't know, probably about uh, part two of this series, when I reamed those one eighth holes, these one eighth holes and the other one eighth hole going through there where the bearing rides, was not happy with how that reamer was going through the titanium. So I know that those holes were a little bit oversized and that's what's gonna bring that play. So I knew I was gonna have a little bit of play there. I've gotta come up with a, a better way to finish those holes. Uh, reaming them isn't gonna cut it. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and bore those or I may try just actually punching through, uh, just using a 1 8 carbide drill after I maybe rough the hole out instead of trying to use a reamer. Just the titanium got a little gummy, I think, and gummed up the reamer and, and made them a little bit oversized. But there we go. You can see how the, the logo came out. So it came out nicely, lined up right inside the notch. Again, I'll snap a couple of pictures of this because I think sometimes the pictures come out a little bit better than what I get on the video. But you can see where the, the logo came out, nicely centered up in the notch. Patent number is just kind of nice, a little bit subtle on the back side there with the pocket clip. Overall, I think I am happy with how that turned out and ready to, you know, go into a little bit more production mode and try to crank out about maybe 10 or 15 of these in a run and, uh, and get some of these ready. I've got a couple people who want some for Christmas, so yeah, I definitely need to get a few of these done and wrapped up. So again, opens nicely. Maybe just a little bit tight still on the closing, although, you know, it still works. So maybe work on a little bit, uh, just tweak some of that a little bit to clean up the action there. But there it is. There is our series to get this complete. Hope you enjoyed watching some of that. You know, just a nice little bit of friction on there where the blade kind of holds and stops. And nice flipping that out. Got a nice weight to it. Definitely, uh, Fairly hefty with those titanium scales on both sides. You know, maybe you can, uh, maybe I'll have to cut a little bit out of the backside. Maybe I'll lighten that up just a little bit. But I don't know. It's got a nice, got a nice weight to it. Definitely has a nice feel in the hand. And then I think for another video, I may do a stress test on it. Try to see uh, how strong that lock mechanism really is. I don't necessarily have a good scientific way to do that, but uh, we'll put some weight on the end of the blade and just see how much weight it'll hold up. I guess. Make sure it's a good sturdy lock. There it is. Well, YouTube, that is a wrap on another video here in the Blades to Be shop, and that is gonna wrap up this six-part series making this triple BS knife with the triple BS knife lock. Gotta tell you though, after uh, all the hours that I have put into this, not 100% impressed with how this turned out. I mean, it's got great action for opening, so it opens up nice, but it's a little sticky in the open position. And uh, I know exactly why that happened. When that pin was a little bit sticky on the side, instead of working the pin, uh, I thought the problem was something I'd experienced with one of my prototypes on uh, just how far that bearing went into the detent on the blade. And I worked on that detent a little bit, and now that, uh, that ball is going a little bit too far into the blade, and that's what's hanging up, and that's what's catching when it's in the open position. So, can't complain too much. I mean, a big part of being out here in the shop is all the learning, and, you know, I learned a ton going through and making this on how to use this Tormach 1100MX and programming in Fusion 360, building all the pieces, really the first project working with that much titanium. So, hey, a lot of learning in here. Uh, I just wish that in the end it didn't have a, a, you know, a little boo-boo that we're not able to correct and fix. But it's not a total loss because one of the other things I wanted to do is I really wanted to stress test this triple BS knife lock, find out how strong the lock really is. So uh, now I'm not going to feel near as bad when I start pounding and beating and hanging weights off of this knife trying to see if I can wreck it. So since it already has a couple of issues with it, I won't feel so bad about, uh, about trying to wreck it a little bit further. Never a total loss out here in the shop, but uh, yeah, I wish this had turned out a little better. But I did uh, learn what was going on with it. So I've only done four other prototypes of this lock mechanism, and every time I'm making little adjustments, little tweaks. So I think I have finally narrowed down all the changes, and that should definitely help with uh, eliminating errors going forward. So for those of you who subscribe to the channel, I sure appreciate you watching all these videos. I hope you enjoyed going through and watching this multi-part series, building out the knife and all the parts and just everything we did here on the 
the CNC machine. And if you're new to the channel, hey, great time to hit that subscribe button if you want to see more videos on machining, welding, knife making, just everything else we have going on here in the Blades to Be shop. Appreciate all the comments coming in. If you've got ideas for the channel, ideas for future videos, I'd love to hear them, love to read about them. Also, I have some ideas. We'll kind of step away from knife making for a little bit. So until next time, I hope you're out in your own shop working on some projects of your own. I'll be here in the Blades to Be shop working on something, definitely working on uh, producing some more of these knives and uh, some other cool things, I think, for some videos for the future as well. Till I get that next video out, Y'all take care.